Mm. America, mm. the OK Corral. America daily gunfights at the OK Corral here on Think Tech uh, on American Issues Take Two. And we have our, our co-host, Tim Apicella. We have our regular contributor, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Welcome, you guys. Morning. Hi. Let me go out of order for this show and ask Stephanie to tell the story she just told about the gun march in Washington, because I think it's very, very interesting and it, it, it appropriately sets the stage for our discussion. I did attend the gun march in the early part of June, um, I think it was the second week of June, on the mall. And uh, they had uh, uh, quite a huge stage set up and the, the star speaker was uh, David Hogg. And he uh, himself um, is from Parkland and has uh, been involved in a school shooting, but escaped unhurt. And ever since he was in that high school, um, he has sworn to, to do something. He and his fellow students were going to stay on it and not let it go. I think it's been about a dozen years ago and he's worked hard on it. Now he's a, a Harvard student and he's a very powerful speaker. So he, he was um, speaking about what we have accomplished and how there are gains, there are some gains. And so it's a matter of knowing that this is hard work and we'll have to continue. So as he was, uh, he finished up and um, that had, he had been preceded by other um, singing songs and other uh, survivors who told their stories. But as he finished up, then the regular MC came back and uh, was going to start into more local stuff and what happened, what was going to happen next. And then all of a sudden, when my friend with me wanted to leave because of various needs so we we started to back out of the crowd and start to walk over uh to another part of the mall but we were still within the crowd and making our way out and trying not to you know get in the way of their view line to the to the stage and and to the screen but and then all of a sudden there was this commotion and people started to run and and uh run past us and so the immediate response uh was to run too uh, I guess this is our herd response. And I, I found myself running and then some people were dropping on the ground. I didn't hear anything except just general commotion, but everybody was starting to run. And so I was just about ready to dive down when somebody from the stage uh, was screaming from the stage, there is no gun, stop running. There's no gun, stop running. And so people started to uh, slow down and uh, and go back to a regular pace and disperse and start dispersing. Okay, well, stop, stop, stop there. And Tim, let me ask you, what, what did we learn from that about public reaction to the possibility of a random attack? Well, that backs up the whole notion of why people want to uh, carry weapons, uh, not just have weapons inside their home, but also carry <laughs> in public either concealed or open carry, uh, it's fear. And what Stephanie was describing was, and she said the hurt effect, um, the hurt effect is fear. We're human beings, we have emotions and fear is certainly ranks right up there. Uh, sometimes fear is good and sometimes as Stephanie described, fear can be detrimental. But um, this feels the whole reason why people, Americans are, are fear-based uh, thanks to certain media and um, you know, TV shows, we're a fear-based society. And therefore we think there's a threat around every corner. We think, um, my God, I can't travel internationally because there's a terrorist on every plane. Um, it's ridiculous, but that's where we're at as our society today. Stephanie, going back to your experience there at the gun march, suppose you had a 38 in your pocketbook while you were running. Would it have done you any good? That's such a good question, Jay. And I think that is the point that's being made uh, around all of these crises. For the most part, having a gun does not, the, the statistics say it doesn't protect you because nobody uses the gun in an appropriate manner or in the worst case gets the gun turned back upon themselves. So I think that as we go ahead and even talk about the recent events we've had, in gun shooting, those with guns were not able to, to, to help at all. I want to do that. I want to go back to the, you know, some of the 
recent um, mass uh, shootings, and, and in PS, there are 11 mass shootings every week in this country of ours. You, know? you got that's the backdrop of all of this. So, Tim, um, you know, you know, we saw yesterday in the news the use of the word random. Uh, and it was used in connection with the uh, IRS and its, quote, random, end quote, audit um, of uh, both um, uh, uh, Andrew um, McCabe. McCabe and uh, the Comey. other, F and uh, uh, Comey, <clears throat> back, back a few years ago. And, um, of course, the, all the circumstances show that it wasn't random at all, that they were intentionally audited, serious, deep audits. Um, by, by Trump, which is really ugly in terms of you know, where the autocrats might take us uh, if they win for office. The corruption of, of our, one of our most sacred institutions, that is the honesty of the Internal Revenue Service. And P.S., uh, the guy who's running the Revenue Service right now is the same guy that Trump appointed and who was in office at the time of these, quote, random uh, uh, audits. But I'm just referring to the word random, because I think random is important in, in this conversation. So if I live in Cincinnati, and there is a, an attack, a mass shooting in Buffalo, uh, am I, do I care? I mean, the honest answer for the ordinary person, do I care? Am I going to get excited about this and go to Washington and write my congressman? The average person. Or do I see the randomness in Buffalo um, as completely random and not affecting me? I think this is very important in terms of galvanizing public opinion. You can have any number of um, you know, anti-gun organizations around the country, but people only seem to get excited when the random points at them, when they are in the OK Corral. What, what do you think of that? Why aren't people, I, say, I, I hate to use this term, but I'm going to, use this term. Why aren't people up in arms? <laughs> you, you heard it here on Think Tank. Yeah, I did. <laughs> Such a pun. Such a pun, Jay. Uh, why are they not upset? Why are they not? Well, this is true for um, anything in, that occurs in life. It's always the other guy. It's not me. It's not affecting my family or my, my immediate neighborhood or my immediate community. But if you watch all these shootings in these rural areas, in these cities, the first thing they said, or they do say is, I would have never imagined this could happen to our town or our city or our this fill in the blank. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's disassociation. It's always the other person. Right. And I, I think a lot of, you know, the, the need for people to um, have a gun on every street corner and in every pocket and in every car um, glove box is that need for, you know, again, as I already said, it is a fear-based thing, but it's, um, it's extrapolating, if you will. It's the sum to more argument. Some of this crime takes place here. Therefore, it's going to happen everywhere in America. And so you, you look at the sum to more argument, and it's, of course, it's faulty. I mean, you can poke holes all through it. But that seems to win the day on a very superficial and generic basis. No one questions that argument. They ought to. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, maybe it's a matter of, uh, am I my brother's keeper? I mean, I think there was a time, I, I wasn't around necessarily, but there was a time when we cared about what happened in, in the next city, in the next state over. Um, and I, at that time might have been around the time of my favorite musical, The Music Man, which is an expression of American caring, uh, the American, the development of the American ethic in the, what, early 20th century in, in rural America. Um, but you know what, it, it strikes me that Part of this, I don't care about what happens in Cincinnati, uh, is, is part of a, a, a drift, a cultural drift in the United States, where we really don't care what happens elsewhere. I, I'm reminded of a guy that I had a conversation with back in 2017, and we were talking about Trump's uh, Tax Reform Act that he, 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 he pushed through Congress. I mean, he just pushed it through Congress without any hearings or anything. And, and I took the position that for the country, it was a really terrible, bad bill. And it is. It was and it is. But this fellow said, no, no, no. Uh, my company is going to get a big refund. So as far as I'm concerned, it's a great bill because it helps me. 
And I said, are you only interested in you and your company and your refund? Don't you care about the, co the country? And he said, and he's a smart guy and all this, he said, no, I don't. I care about me. I care about my company. I care about my refund. Isn't that the American ethic? And I said, no, it, it can't be. We, we, we have to get together on this. We have to care about each other. Now, do you see in all of this, um, you know, not caring about what happens the next town over, not worrying what happens in Buffalo um, as, as part of a drift away from caring, Stephanie? Oh, you know, I, what you're saying to me is that the corporate attitude, I mean, that that's, um, you know, capitalism, you know, so maybe he was speaking out of that side of his head. But I want to point out that um, and looking around a little bit at the news today on this, Texans are the majority of Texas, according to the latest polls, want gun control and only um 14% are interested in loosening gun control and 28% are really great with what's going on now. They like what it is now and they don't want to loosen it. They do not want to loosen the gun control. So I, I think that maybe um, the, the, this, this lack of empathy is, is not, is just calmed down because there, we're so, we have so much of it that people are not in an outrage unless they're actually involved in it. And people are now maybe operating at a different level where they will go and vote when, when we get the chance to vote for this. And then on the other hand, everybody's grown, many people have grown up around guns. I mean, I went to high school in South Texas again, I, um, and everybody had guns, and, I mean, but there weren't any ARs or anything, but you know, it was not, a, nobody paid any attention to it. There were just guns and they never got uh misused at that time, even among the, the high school people I was with. So I just think it was a living in the culture. I think people think that we're safe if you're in that culture and know how that culture works, but it's all been changed because of the introduction of the assault, the assault rifles, and also these people. Well, it's more, it's more, I think, uh, you know, when you went to high school, and I'm not, I'm not going to discuss on the air when that was. Uh, <laughs> it was, it was, it was in, in the very early days of the NRA. <laughs> And in the very early days of the NRA, you know, they would they would talk about gun safety and you come and have classes uh, about gun safety and how you shouldn't, you know, do silly things with your 22 rifle. Um, there were no assault rifles at all. And so there have been, you know, dramatic changes in the availability of these guns. And and the of course, the NRA, boy, the NRA is 180 out from where it was when you and I were kids. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, but the thing, the thing, Tim, is we are living in this okay corral where these events happen 11 times a week. They happen at random all over the country. Um, they happen with, um, you know, deaths of all these people who never get to talk about it. You know, history is told by the survivors, not by the ones, the, the victims who are killed. And so my question to you, Tim, is over the past few years, and especially during the Trump administration, we have seen a dramatic increase. Uh, in gun violence, in assault rifle gun violence, in mass killings, um, in school killings. It, it, it's extraordinary. What, as a country, have we learned from watching this every day? How many times? You know, it's like two a day, every day. We may not see all of it in the paper, but every day. What have we learned? Well, what's what we haven't learned, and you know, remember we had a ten-year assault weapons ban, and there was a correlation, statistical correlation, to uh, the decrease of, of of murders and 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 mass shootings that went down as a result of that weapons ban. Uh, you know, Mitch McConnell did say something I didn't have the issue with, believe it or not, for the first time, and he said we have a huge mental illness problem in this country. Yeah, that's obvious. Because almost everyone that is, you know, conducting these mass shootings, they're mentally ill. The well, problem is, how do the mentally this, ill, how do the mentally ill this, gain access to these assault weapons? What about and mental illness? The rub. What about mental illness in the Senate? Yeah, well, that's obvious. Look at uh, Green, Marjorie Taylor Green. I mean, that's that's a that was a setup question, Jay. <laughs> that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> but I'm saying this. Um, you know, even the Republicans should realize that, yes, mental illness wins the day with a lot of, lot of troubled youths and a lot of troubled individuals in this country. Why not 
stiffen and toughen up background checks, to include strict mental background checks, to really, really uh, toughen up the red flag laws that make it so much easier to, to notice someone who's having some issues and they have access to assault weapons. Why not do that? I mean, yeah, I know the NRA tells them don't think about it, but you know what? Strike out from the NRA, grow a set and, and do something about it. Well, you know, the father of the latest shooter on the fourth, you know, he, they had problems, but he actually filled out the FOID, mm -hmm. the firearms ownership uh, registration card for um, his kid. And he's now kind of sheepishly, sheepishly saying that maybe there are a few problems, but that what you're up against there is how would you like it when somebody walked up to you and said, you know what, your son is really goofy. And I think we're just going to have to take him under control here and report him. You know, people, we, we don't have the tools. We don't have the system set up. We don't have the diagnosis of reliability or validity for making these kinds of, of, of statements about people and putting them in that situation. And, and that it's just, a, it's just, you don't a, we're not. I actually going to take a little exception to the, one of that statements that you made, Stephanie. We do have the capability. And uh, during Homeland Security, if there was a terrorist suspect, um, all agencies were alerted to it. There was a communication process. Uh, that doesn't apply to background checks and people who are applying to get a weapon or not even have to apply for a weapon. They just can get one through uh, loopholes and gun shows and all that stuff. Well, the new the new law. So we do the, have the system in place. It's do we have the money and the willpower to transfer that sophistication of background checks uh, to the gun the gun issue? Are, are you saying, are either of you saying that the system we have in place is adequate? I'd really no. like to hear an answer on that. I'm not saying that. Nobody says that the bipartisan Safer Communities Act law that was recently passed in June has uh, now put 750 million on the table for more education and training in, in the extreme risk protection um, that, that's needed most of the time, otherwise known as red flag law. So there, there is, that's a big gain in that bill that was recently passed. So there's a bunch of money to make that happen. And, that, and it hasn't, and they agree that there isn't enough out there, enough training or enough education or enough practice with thinking about applying the red flag laws. And we've got to get much, much better at that. I okay, mean, uh, let me, what, so Jay, what I'm saying, Jay, what yeah. I'm saying is we have the capability, that capability actually is in use uh, as it pertains to uh, terrorism or would be terrorism acts in this country. We just don't have the, the, the capability or the, the financial resources to transfer that, that technology and that, and that energy towards um, background checks and, and gun safety. We just don't, no, we don't, we, we choose not, not to do that. Yeah, well, you're not talking about the, the divisiveness in the country and how some people uh, don't want any gun control at all, including That's those right. on the Supreme Court of the United States of America um, and in the Senate. Uh, they just don't want any gun control at all. So yeah. let me, well, let, me Thomas, shift, let me shift Tom, gears. Okay. I think, I think we've been going down the street about, you know, okay, mental illness and safety checks and, uh, and um, you know, red flag laws and all these things. And, and they've, been, they've been in discussion lately, but I wanna suggest to you that maybe all of that uh, is, 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 is soft thought. And that what we really need is a, a strong gun control policy. Now in, this, in the country of New Zealand, I think it's New Zealand, um, a few years ago, they were concerned there were too many guns. And by the way, there were only a few guns compared to this country. Um, and they said, uh, we're going to buy them back. We're going we're to pay you fair value for every gun. And, uh, and, and we'll give you money. We'll send you a check for the gun. And if you don't uh, sell it back to us, we're going to put you in jail. So it's a good deal. Honestly, it's a good deal. Um, why don't we do that? I mean, if I were king, I would say we cannot tolerate even one school shooting, even one crazy shooter. <clears throat> All of these soft steps are not really going to help us in the long term because um, people don't abide by them. Because in fact, on a daily, 11 times a week basis, they don't really work. And so we need really strong steps to stop every single mass shooting there is. 
And that means get all the guns out of circulation, every bloody one of them. Why can't we do that, Tim? I wouldn't, I wouldn't support it. Uh, as King, would, are you going to guarantee every rural community that has uh, no police force or a police force that's an hour away or a half hour away, you're going to guarantee <laughs> that community that there's no crime? I'm telling you right now, the reason people own weapons is to protect themselves in absence of any active police force interceding before the crime takes place. I'm one of them. I do okay, not believe well, that, you know, uh, I, that a police will be there at my front door to stop a perpetrator from breaking in my house and doing God knows what. So it's up to me. Wow. We haven't actually heard that on the show before, but now we know. Um, Stephanie, you know, you, you grew up in Texas. Do you agree with Tim about that? Well, I'd like to give a shout out to a father of a shot teenager son in one of these high school students who I think has an, a real true answer that is perhaps more powerful if we could do it than find the guns back. Because I think as Tim says in this country, people are not going to be as amenable to that as they were in, was it was it Australia they did that too? I think both, but New Zealand comes both, to yeah. mind. And, and by the way, it succeeded. It, it did it succeed. Was and they had, yes. yes, it's absolute and uh, it's fabulous. So yes, I'd love to do it, but I, do, I don't see that that's got much traction for now. Maybe it will, but this man said, and he wanted attention. I'd like to give him some attention for it. He said, what we need to do is not take our kids to school. Let keep kids out of school. Oh, I got a better one. Let's go Congress a step, let's go a step back. Let's not have kids. <laughs> well, no, let's that, I think then that we wouldn't that. have a problem here. In the but school. Jay, we're talking about every we've already done it for the pandemic. We already know how to keep the kids out of school. Everybody's done it. And if the whole nation got it together and most of the kids were not in school, how long would that go on? Okay, what are you saying? Let's get rid of schools. No, we're saying out of school until you pass a law that will stop school shootings. It's a, which a means protest. There are no ARs or it's whatever. A protest you're describing. Well, that's an interesting idea. Um, but what, what about the truant officer? I know they have them in Texas. Uh, who comes around and and, uh, and 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 gets your kid, and takes them to school? Well, this is a national protest. Don't answer the door. I think this is as good <laughs> as good as it gets. I think we could make make something happen if that man's idea would get us uh, some traction in the country, and just have the whole nation have a stop attending school until you make them safe. And there's only one way to make them safe, and that's get the guns out. Okay. So we'll so, all to right. Okay. Get the guns out. So. Let's assume there's a national protest and people don't send their kids to school <laughs> until something happens. Of course, uh, you know, there are 330 million people in this country. Not all of them are going to agree on exactly what should happen before they send their kid back to school. But let's, let's again make you the monarch here, Tim. <clears throat> what should happen before, you send your, before people send their kids back to school? Exactly what? What in the court, including the Supreme Court of the United States of America um, and, the, and the Senate? What should happen? What kind of rules and legislation well, I, I, and decisions would you want? Great question. It's hypothetical, but it's a great question. And I, I suspect that it would be similar to what we have here in Hawaii. And that is, if you feel the need to, have a, a, to open carry or conceal permit to carry, you better have a really, really great reason because you're not going to get the permit to do so. And if you're caught concealing or open carry, uh, there's going to be heavy, heavy criminal penalties. So um, it's, it is access. I mean, there is a correlation. It's a cause effect. Uh, access to guns will lead to more, more shootings. And it's just that simple. Um, I'm not a big proponent of allowing people to carry guns on the open street, nor concealed, unless you have a real good reason. like. Um, you know, from 12 o'clock, I take a bag of, of diamonds and I, I go from this location back to, uh, to my safe deposit box. I need a weapon in case I'm, someone's going to try to steal my bag of diamonds. Um, or you're, you're a private detective or you're, you know, you're a policeman uh, that, you know, off duty, you may need to act as a policeman off duty. Uh, my friend was a police chief. He always carried a gun. And of course, there's areas where you can't carry a gun and he didn't. 
Uh, actually, to get on that point, sorry to make a little left turn here, but in uh, Justice Thomas's opinion, he recognized that guns are not always suitable to all places. And that would be uh, courts and schools and state capitals and voting facilities. He said there is something called uh, sensitive areas or se sensitive places. Now, that's a broad category. And I'm hoping that Hawaii and other states will say, well, we're going to also include um, um, bars. We're going to include stadiums. We're going to include sporting events. And the list could go on of what constitutes a sensitive area. So that's how the states, I think, are going to try to address this uh, Supreme Court decision as far as New York and um, opening that law up for gun carry. Hawaii is in a similar circumstance with regard yeah, to- they're very much in a circumstance. And I think what you're going to see is a heavy, heavy emphasis on um, training, uh, not only how to use the gun, but when you are allowed to use a gun, what, what constitutes a threat. Uh, B, uh, certainly mental background checks, fingerprinting, uh, all sorts of stuff that's going to be, a gun owner may perceive them as onerous and cumbersome, too bad. Well, you guys, Stephanie, when do I send my kid back to school? What will yeah. satisfy you? Well, first of all, we're talking about a general category of guns. I think that the nation is committed to gun, some kinds of guns. I, the issue is the assault weapons. And we had that law on the books um, and that expired and that Congress did not re-up it. And if we could get that law re up that you cannot purchase an assault rifle, i.e. Uh, AR. I mean, they are that what those do to people is is, is just unacceptable. Well, well there what must is, be somebody to... has a reason. There must be somebody has a reason for wanting or permitting an assault rifle. And I wonder if you could take a little of our time here today and tell us what those reasons are. I see no reason for a war, uh, uh, a weapon of war that you, you would use in warfare. Are you trying to say it's ridiculous to have ordinary citizens carry assault rifles around? Absolutely. I think we ought to go back when I was in high school. <laughs> we didn't have assault weapons. <laughs> you can have your rifle. You can shoot the javelina. And my God, the, the, the snakes, you know, the poisonous snake needs to be shot too every now and then. So we have we have lived with guns and we've lived with guns in reasonable ways. In fact, in the West, in the West, in Dodge City, their gun laws were tougher than what we've got now. Marshall Dillon didn't put up with this. He was grabbing people's guns all the time. OK, <laughs> speaking of the OK Corral. So I think that we need to be. Or, you know, the, or the saloon that you walked into the saloon and there was a place where you'd have to hang your gun right? a little hook. You have to hang your gun before Not you came in. Yeah, because you're going to shoot you. But anyway, I think that we need to be more specific um, and um, and be reason reasonable about the variety, the diversity of American experience and thinking and can and and values uh, about gun ownership. And uh, you know, we're we're stuck on it. Yeah, I don't hear it. I mean, if I had a kid uh, who, uh, especially in Texas, uh, I'm not sure what would satisfy me. Um, I'd be I'd be pretty tough about that. I, I want Congress to take affirmative action. And the uh, dishwater uh, bill that was signed uh, about a week or two ago is dishwater. I'm sorry. Um, and, and the action of the Supreme Court was, you know, on the flip side of that, much, much worse. So right now we're uh, what is it? We're we're naked. We're going naked. We really don't have reliable gun control in this country. Uh, so my question to you, Tim, is what is going to happen? Uh, as Stephanie says, we have a gun culture. We have shootouts at the OK Corral 11 times a week. Is that number going to decrease, increase? I mean, if you take all the regulation away, if you let people carry with or without permits, um, if you, you know, I mean, when's the last time you heard of somebody being arrested for carrying a gun? Those days seem to be over. You know? I mean, even if it's against the law, who arrests anybody? What police force is arresting? What prosecutor is arresting people for simply carrying a gun? I'm not sure anyone is. I think we've moved across the Rubicon here, and it's a free-for-all. But my question to you, Tim, and I don't mean to make it easy, is where is this path going to lead us? Well, it's going to lead us to more OK corrals, uh, particularly when we have a um, polarized nation based on a number of social wedge issues and tempers are hot. 
And uh, the more that you, or you're allowed to carry a weapon, the more uh, the, uh, the likelihood it's going to be used in haste and in, in, in on the, you know, the passion of the moment. And I hate to say it, but um, it's needless. It doesn't have to happen. And I agree with Stephanie. I agree with you that there is no functional purpose for an AR-15 to be carried. I don't even think there's a need for an AR-15 to be used in the household, but um, that's a whole nother issue. But we're gonna have more, we're gonna have more intimidation. We're gonna have more violence. Uh, just to offset this story, I, I talked to a gentleman who lived in Tucson, Arizona, and he, he takes a different viewpoint. He said, uh, everyone in Tucson carries and there's no crime because everyone knows the other person has a weapon and it could be used. So therefore, people think twice before they start a confrontation with somebody because they know even women carry a little pea shooter in their purse and they say, so people avoid conflict. I, I, I don't I, think I, I buy that. I don't think I buy I, that I don't, argument. I don't buy it on fact or policy. Yeah, I don't think I buy it either, but that's how uh, people who want to have this law enacted, that's, that's kind of where they're coming from. Well, but do we, uh, should we build that into our national policy, Stephanie? Because in fact, you know, the recognition of the red, what do you call it, the red line law, red and flag, the red red flag line. law, and, and the need for, um, you know, uh, addressing mental illness, those things recognize a, an essential element of the human condition. That mm -hmm. is, we are mammals. And we get, as Tim says, we get excited, we get emotional. And when we do, uh, we get murderous with or without a gun. And don't forget the case of Vincent Chin, who was beat to death by the baseball bat because he was Asian. Uh, and ultimately, uh, the people who did that to him really didn't suffer at all in our legal yeah. justice system. Yeah. Um, but, but you know, the, the justification was I got really excited, really angry, and I, I felt I had to kill him. Um, and so uh, if you have a national population with that particular flaw, and we recognize it does exist, for a number of people, who knows how many, then we are going to have mass shootings and deaths and killings simply based on uh, an inability to control your emotions. Um, well, the, the bipartisan safer communities law is, you know, funding and, and, and promoting um, understanding of how they work and the provision for an extreme risk protection act by police or judges that where they can take weapons away from people because it is known that there there is an extreme risk for them to have have a weapon so i mean i think we have got some some things to work with in that what you say is a pretty milk toasty law but that's what we could get through and they've they're they're shouting it out that it's bipartisan <laughs> so we've got a bipartisan effort here to toughen up some of um the the red flag laws and and others um, background checks for gun, gun buyers and some of these are already on the books in in states and even in states where they're on the books like Illinois where that Fourth of July shooter was they they they're not known about or they're and people are not educated and, and able to work with them as well as they should have done with with somebody like that that shot those people on the Fourth of July. Yeah, so I, over the over the years uh, and over recent months especially Tim. Um, we have talked on this show and on your show about the possibility of violence in this country. And, and as we get closer to November and, the, you know, the way the divisiveness will express itself and the lack of mm, mm, full and failed voting will express itself in November, um, there's a possibility of violence. What role does gun control play in the, um, you know, the realization of that violence? Well, thanks to the Supreme Court decision, less. I mean, it's a perfect storm. This couldn't have happened at a worse time because now people feel emboldened to open carry. Open carry where? On the street? Um, what if it's a political rally? I don't think uh, Justice Thomas uh, took a political rally as a sensitive place. I don't think he defined it as a sensitive place. So uh, it's fertile grounds for someone to show up at a political rally with an AR-15. As long as it's not concealed, or a Glock 17, um, it's it's really bad timing. That's that's my answer. Yeah, that's why uh, your um, your 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 um, gun control meeting that you spoke about in Washington, Stephanie, is so touching. It's mm -hmm. just as just as well there could have been a shooter there. 
Sure. Just as well. It could have been something like the Las Vegas incident a couple of years ago. Well, it was televised. It was a perfect opportunity for somebody with those needs to be. We can able expect to that. If we itself. can expect it at a parade on yeah. July 4th. We can expect it at a political rally by somebody who doesn't necessarily agree with what's being said at that rally. I mean, this is coming down the block. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> the well, other thing I want to mention, we haven't talked about what we should before we close. Not only do we have a gun, you know, gun control problem and a gun culture in the country, we have an ongoing exacerbation of that in our entertainment. In other words, uh, I I'll give you five hours of entertainment every day or more on cable and everywhere on, on the network channels of, of movies that are filled with, with gunshots, filled with guns, filled with guns. Um, we're all experts in all these guns and shooting people up usually on the basis of violence or hatred. Um, and, it, you know, it's pulp fiction is what it is, but it surrounds us. It, it immerses us. And uh, I think for a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people, it has the effect of making them extol the violence and embrace the vengeance and the hatred and mm -hmm. say, well, this is justified. Um, and in any event, if I'm a good guy, I'll go to the hospital and they'll make magic medicine on me. And I'll be I'll be walking around in two hours. Uh, it, quite something that we have a culture that accepts, embraces all of that, and that's got to be a factor in the way people think about guns, and the way that they think about using guns, and the acceptance of motivations for using guns. And we're getting that. We're getting it every single day. In my observation, it is exacerbating the problem. Do you agree? I do agree. Um, I think they've shown time and time again. The psychological profile of a lot of these shooters, uh, a, a huge component of that is they're watching these shooter videos. It's not just TV shows. It's, it's mm -hmm. the videos that uh, basically put you at the hand of the gun and you're shooting either um, cops, zombies, or, or anything in between. Mm -hmm. And um, you look at Columbine. They were the first ones to have a psychological profile of, of watching shooter videos. Um, so your, your point is, is not incorrect at all. I mean, I mean, I remember in high school doing a, a speech on the correlation between TV violence and, and violence in society. And though you, it's hard to draw a one-to-one -one correlation, you know, a, a, a reasonable educated person could say, yeah, there is a correlation. And one other point before we go, and that is um, the fact that when these um, uh, mass killings, the mass, uh, mass murders happen in uh, Valdi, in, in Buffalo, in um, Highland Park, uh, in Florida, I mean, all over the country. It's like pin the tail on the map, always at random. <clears throat> um, the press uh, eats that stuff up. And uh, depending on how bad it is, you know, you could spend your whole day, every day, and your whole week and your whole month watching. And as it gets worse and there are more of them, there's more time dedicated to examining what happened here, what was the shooter like? What kind of a weapon? And by the way, we're not only talking about the, um, what do you call it, assault rifles. The, the one used in Highland Park was a Smith & Wesson uh, 15, uh, 30 clip, um, or semi-automatic, I think it was. So there's a lot of guns that, that fall in the assault weapon category uh, that are not the classic assault weapon um, and that are made by big companies. Not only the, was it the Daniel Company, um, but also Smith & Wesson, which is otherwise a very um, long-term company. Anyway, to, to get back to the point, uh, and this is something you talk about all the time, Tim, the press is celebrating this stuff. It's like, it's like Bonnie and Clyde. We like them. We like Bonnie and Clyde. And we, we Gemut Lechai, the opposite of Gemut Lechai, Schadenfreude. Schadenfreude is to, you know, to revel in the misfortune of others, German word. And, and, um, and I think that the press provides news and works that news over and over and over again every time there is a mass shooting. Is this contributing to the gun culture? Stephanie? I think it's contributing to those who are fantasizing and having these disaster fantasies about going and doing that sort of thing. Um, I think um, there's, a, there's a show that has no guns in it. And yet the, the largest challenges are placed upon the humans within in the show situation. And may I invite you to watch Naked and Afraid. 
<laughs> exhale. <laughs> and they're out there having to find something to eat. They don't even have a gun to hunt with, you know, so that's the place to go. It is possible to be in a world without the um, the gun. And it's just occurred to me that uh, that that's a place where some very macho people go at who are trying to show that they're strong and brave and they can overcome anything. And they're doing it without a gun, America. <laughs> You don't need a gun. <laughs> There's much. Okay, up. well, let's go. To, let's go to uh, final comments. And um, uh, Tim, I, uh, I assume you're going to cover that last point about the press, also. No, fact, actually, what? I'm not. Okay. Well, <laughs> well, okay. Well, in that case, let's go to your final comment now. My final comment is three things: one, ban ban all assault re weapons; um, two, perform rigorous mental and criminal background checks. And three, use common sense when you're passing gun safety laws. I'm trying not to say gun control because half of this country doesn't like the word control. It is about semantics. Gun safety uh, laws need to be enacted and start with the uh, ban on assault weapons and rigorous, rigorous background checks. And add some judges to the Supreme Court. Did I hear you say that? Could have. <laughs> All right, Stephanie, your turn. Uh, I'll certainly reiterate your last point, Jay, and I agree. I think Tim has got the magic list that we need to start checking off, and uh, I think uh, we 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 can do it. Or um, uh, we need to keep the kids out of school until the Congress acts on it. And also, there's the matter of the ammunition. How about let's cut that off? I think some countries have done that. You don't get ammunition, so you can have as many guns as you want. <laughs> there's no ammunition. Okay, except under extreme circumstances. So there's lots of ways to go with this. And then there's also naked and afraid, so you don't have to deal with any guns. Okay, well, we really covered all the ground here. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tim. Tim Apicella, Stephanie Stoll Dalton, uh, for a very discussion and far, uh, a far ranging discussion of the subject. I'm sure that by the time we meet next, there'll be more to discuss oh, in terms no. of mass, mass shootings. Uh, aloha, you guys. Aloha. Stay safe. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.